Okay, so good morning or good afternoon if you're Joel back east as well. Uh, it's uh, our pleasure to bring here our, our study and information about documenting triage. So my name is Randy Labonte from the Canadian eLearning Network, Canny Learn, uh, and uh, happy to be a part of that as well. And Michael Barber, who's a founding um, member as well from Turo University, but he really still is from the Rock in Newfoundland. And Joel Nagel, who's uh, in back east in melting snow uh, mm. as well, which is great. And she's been with us now. This journey started a year ago, I guess. I Pretty can't cool. believe it. <laughs> so why don't you talk a little bit, Joel, about uh, yourself as well as what you've got here for us. And uh, Michael and I will chime in from time to time to add some commentary. Absolutely. So welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, through these pandemic times. And so what we're going to be talking about today is the pan-Canadian response to emergency remote teaching that began a year ago in March. So this presentation um, is reporting on three reports that we have put together. The first was specifically what ministries of education um, did in the, the spring of 2020, once we found out that, um, yes, we are indeed in a pandemic and we need to make sure that everything is closed and locked down. So that was um, a culmination of the research there. Then, of course, um, going into September, what did that look like? Did things change? Um, what was changed going back into our schools? And then of course, the third report um, moved through the narratives of students and administrators and teachers and what it was like for them to actually go through this and experience um, emergency remote teaching. So fairly quickly, um, I would say after we realized um, just before the March spring break here across Canada that um, our numbers were rising and we needed to do something to curtail um, our numbers was that we had that closure of schools. And so every jurisdiction um, within, you know, a couple of weeks was closed down. Um, some schools or some jurisdictions rather were able to open up by the end of March and have some kind of structure in place um, for their schools to kind of um, pivot as the word to remote emergency um, remote teaching and then by the beginning of April the mid of April um, everybody followed suit so it was really interesting I think to see how quickly the jurisdictions were able to um, mobilize um, and have the individual boards and di districts mobilize together to make sure that they had um, all of our students having the ability to have what they needed to engage in online learning. And there were some jurisdictions that were able to provide devices for students. And I know that um, some of these things manifested quite differently at the very local level. But what um, we were able to see um, through the research is this broad kind of spectrum of what ministries were reporting and um, what news, re news was reporting on what um, these larger institutions were able, able to do for their provinces and territories. So for example, in Ontario, um, the technology was gleaned through each district. So I'm from Windsor in southwestern Ontario, and the boards, you know, gathered up all their, their technology, their iPads, their tablets, their Chromebooks, and all of those things, and started reaching out to families who needed to have access to technology. And Ontario and New Brunswick were the only ones that additionally offered access to internet connectivity so that students could get online. So there was also the opportunity to have offline resources available. This was particularly important for our Northern communities um, that were not able to access um, technology or the internet. And so packages were able to be prepared and sent out. 
And this was either a coordinated effort with the ministry, or again, it um, might have looked very different within each district and school board where schools took the initiative to get packets together. And sometimes even teachers took the initiative to get packets together for their students. But they ranged um, the various resources of those packets, curriculum packets, books for the children, and also in some areas, you know, school supplies, journals, writing materials, art supplies, those kinds of things. And in communities where there was that, um, that need to kind of think about an alternate way that we could connect with students. Nova Scotia partnered with a newspaper locally, and then that newspaper was able to deliver these packages through their newspaper deliveries. And then within the Northwest Territories, they partnered with their local radio station so that they could offer storytelling um, locally for students. So within um, the ministries, there was a lot of, I think rather quickly, websites that were created specifically for each jurisdiction. So these ministry websites could be something that was attached onto their, their own site or something that was um, done separately. And it was basically this space where you could go online where parents could go, teachers could go, students could go to have access to the curriculum, to have access to all sorts of digital tools that they could be using so that they could be learning from home um, and on their own. There were also a wide range of synchronous tools that were available. For example, your Zoom, your Google Meets, your, your Teams, Skype, those kinds of things. And that also ranged um, even differently across jurisdictions. Um, again, with us in our own um, provinces and districts tells a little bit of a different story. So here in Windsor, um, even we have the public and the Catholic school board. Um, one was on Teams, the other is using um, Google Classroom. And then in Toronto, there's you know different um, technologies being used there as well. And you know your bright space, your Moodle. So it did kind of depend um, on where you were situated, but um, all of these things were kind of coming out as what was available um, to utilize for your online learning, if that's what you were engaging within. And then, of course, um, there were extra courses and education opportunities that were um, being offered. Um, Ontario has our public television, TVO. And Quebec also has their tele Quebec television network. And so the, those jurisdictions partnered with those television um, resources so that they could provide opportunities um, for learning for students at home. So it's also a very important conversation to think about when we are moving to emergency remote learning um, so quickly and ministries are kind of scrambling for offering resources and, and how we're going to do this and boards and districts are you know banding together to think about how we can offer access to learning still um, for our students at home. But one of the things that we noticed that was a little bit um, glaring is the opportunities for teachers to engage in professional learning. And so not all jurisdictions um, offered overtly those, those opportunities. That's not to say that things didn't happen at a local level within your specific school or district, but, but there were um, jurisdictions that actually you know, moved forward to kind of have a place online where teachers could go so that we could, um, as teachers, you know, figure out how we're going to you know, conceptualize taking our classroom, our face-to-face -face classroom and putting it online. So there were various things offered like webinars, some offered um, access to university courses. And then of course, there could be other websites that were specifically tailored to how to tutorials. Um, one jurisdiction offered uh, three-day professional developments that were recorded and, and posted online so that teachers could use them when they needed to. And of course, accesses to lots of resources for curriculum support. Now, as these things were offered, of course, it also is important um, whether teachers knew that these opportunities were available. So for Ontario, there were 
um, opportunities for professional learning for teachers. But as my husband is, is a teacher and, you know, kind of talking at our local level, it was not very well promoted or clear that those opportunities were accessible to teachers. So as we kind of moved through the pandemic in the spring and um, kind of thinking about what what that looked like and it was very, um, it wasn't very structured. There were synchronous opportunities and asynchronous opportunities. There were students that chose kind of not to participate in such, but that was sort of right, an, an emergency and it happened and everybody kind of did what they needed to do at the time. But then of course, you know, the end of the year comes and we have that summer opportunity to kind of think about how we're going to conceptualize opening up our schools in September, considering the numbers in each of our jurisdictions and what that meant in terms of how um, September would look like. But across um, Canada, there were really no delays other than British Columbia because um, their numbers had started to spike. So they did end up with a two day delay as well as Saskatchewan. And then in Ontario, um, and this happened right up until like the week, the day before school started, there was a lot of, um, can we open, should we open? And then we were delayed a week and then we were delayed two weeks and a, a staggered start. And then um, even longer for students that chose to stay online and not go into class face-to-face. -face. So starting our schools in September, all of the jurisdictions had extra enhanced health measures. Not all districts or jurisdictions, sorry, um, based on their numbers or lack of numbers, not having numbers at all, required masks. And you know, if they were in their, their bubble or with their cohort, they didn't have to wear a mask in, um, in that. But then if they needed to go outside or in the halls or be somewhere where physical distancing wasn't possible, then those masks needed to be included. And that kind of it was, it was sort of like a very fluid thing. For example, in Ontario, we started with grade four to grade 12 with masks, but then as our numbers throughout the fall started to rise, they changed that and um, all students going into the face-to-face -face setting had to wear masks. So for remote learning, not much changed other than it became a lot more structured where parents were given the choice for their children to stay remotely. And so school boards had to then take their teachers and move them to online settings, um, changing some of the schedules. I know that some pacing um, initiatives were instituted so that the teachers that were doing their online learning was sort of at the same pace with um, their counterparts in the classroom. So for high school particularly, um, some of the courses were gleaned down so that we could have reduced cohorts and mixing. Um, quad masters were introduced so that you would have, you know, two classes. Um, for example, in Ontario, you'd have two classes for, I think it was for eight weeks. And in the morning, you would go face to face for one class. And then the afternoon, you would be at home online with the other class. And then it would, would switch and alternate. Meanwhile, the teacher was then um, working in this hybrid model so that they would have half of their students in their class, but then at the same time, the other half of their, their class would be online and it would shift back and forth. So there were a lot of things that um, ministry websites, ministry um, communiques and, and news reports can tell us about what was happening during the pandemic in terms of you know, resources that are being distributed. Um, how many times a day do we have to be online synchronously? How are we going to do this and how is it going to look? But it's very different, obviously, experience for those that are engaged in and immersed in these experiences. And so our third report really looked at the voices of our, our students and our teachers and our administrators to kind of find out and fill in those gaps about, you know, what actually is happening and how is that making um, our students feel, for example. And so for student experiences, what we heard from our participants was that um, 
there's very isolated. Um, there's, it's very fast. There's lots to do. It's very overwhelming. Understanding that when you're, you're online, it's a much different space than you are face to face. And so there's a lot of autonomous learning that has to go there. And, and how does that happen? Or what does that look like when you have younger students that don't yet have that self regulation? And so the, the pace was also something that students struggled with. Um, I know that for my own experience with my son who um, was eight um, and nine this year, the amount of synchronous um, learning that was kind of um, instituted in Ontario about what teachers were having were being asked to do was a, was a lot for um, a young learner to be sitting there and working through that. And it's very different, obviously, than being face to face. And so, you know, the, there's that isolation, they can't be with their friends, um, that physical activity, those kinds of things all change very fast. So for a teacher, their experiences um, were also, you know, kind of up and down. It just changed everything so much. And I think it was very hard for teachers, especially um, kind of being thrust into this different pedagogical model of being online and not feeling that they had the, the personal resources or tools to, to make it work in the way that they could try and really um, engage students and such. There was also um, um, teachers were able to deliver things to their, to their students. Um, that wasn't, you know, it's not obviously not um, something that's going to be able everywhere. Um, it's very hard to reach out to students that don't show up. Um, and it's very stressful. I mean, I tell my teacher candidates when, you know, we think that we're under stress, but then we also have to layer on that, that stress of the pandemic. And so um, always looking to the government announcements, looking at the daily numbers, thinking about all of these health measures that we have to now institute in our schools and monitor for, for physical distancing and masks and, and those kinds of things. And also there was a real call for our class sizes to be reduced, um, which in most jurisdictions was not a reality that happened. And so again, I know in Alberta and Ontario, the class sizes for elementary were basically the same. And so we're, you know, getting messages about we have to physical distance and, you know, we have to be so responsible out in the community, but then we have our teachers in our classrooms with 25 students or more. And um, how do we navigate through that? So it, it just added on a whole layer of stress um, to what is already a stressful profession. So for our school leaders, you know, they're the ones that have to also navigate their, their staff and their teachers and their schools and be responsible for the health measures that need to be um, instituted as well as kind of monitor over um, if they're online, they would have a principal designated to the online learning and, and what does that look like. And so, again, it's, it's very up in the air. There's not really anything that you can plan what's going to happen in the future. Well, we can sort of have an idea of how, you know, we can plan as a school and, and plan to do this. But as we saw, you know, across Canada with the second and third wave, the numbers are rising, um, things are changing. Um, students were able to, in some jurisdictions, move from if they were online in September, they could make then the switch later in the fall to go in class and vice versa. And so by the end of um, the fall, um, after this third report came out, we saw that um, districts and jurisdictions were moving back online. So Ontario moved back online. Um, actually, Windsor, where, where I am, um, was the first jurisdiction in Ontario to, to go online just before Christmas because our numbers were so high. And then the rest of Ontario followed suit after Christmas and, mo and a lot of jurisdictions made that change because of their numbers um, that were increasing. And then thinking about where we're going to be and a lot of places then were able to kind of move back in February to their online learning or sorry, to their face-to-face -face learning, but again, students had that option of making a change of mode. 
And what that looks like at a local level is then um, a lot of classrooms would have to be rearranged every time and restructured every time that happens. So it created a lot of disruption within the classrooms, even um, no, it was important to offer that. So as we're continuing on and we'll have another report coming out um, again um, in the spring to kind of chronicle have the districts or jurisdictions, you know, learned about what we needed to do? Have we improved now that it's been a year? Have we improved on this model of offering online learning um, as a still an emergency remote option for our students? And so um, we're hoping to have that in June, I believe. And you can have access to all three of our, our research reports from this, uh, the summer, the fall, the two in the fall um, from our website. So thank you very much. And I'm, if we wanted to get into um, a bit of a conversation, I'd really love to, to hear perhaps some of the experiences that you have from your own area of where you are and what it kind of looked like, especially now that, you know, we're kind of moving back in and, and in Ontario here, we're back in now as we've been in a six week lockdown, we've all moved back online. For us, um, with the uncertainty of what was gonna be happening in the public schools, uh, we found that we had a huge uptake in enrollment because we are an, an online school. Uh, that's kind of what we do. So, people chose us kind of as that option because we had the experience behind it, not knowing exactly what um, that looked like for them. So we had families coming in that maybe it wasn't a really great fit for them, but they were doing it because that was the only kind of choice they had because they didn't necessarily trust that their uh, brick and mortar school that they were at would be either able to offer something or offer it safely. Um, I mean, I'm at uh, Regent Christian Online Academy, so our COA, it's based out of Victoria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's just, I, I think what takes a toll is just the, all of the uncertainty and, and really wanting the best for your students, your children, and not really knowing, you know, do I keep them home? Do I switch them and, and keep them home? But for their social emotional learning, should they be in class? Do we, you know, offer that risk? And, and it's true, right? Do you feel confident that your your child's school is is doing whatever they can to ensure their safety? And even if they are, is that enough? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it's you know in Ontario, it, it unfortunately becomes something very political where you have government saying that you know there's no transmission in schools they're very safe places but then the numbers and the reporting paints a very different picture really about how things are being tran transmitted and, and such which causes a lot of I think um, lack of confidence about our choices are we making a good choice to to then send our child there with this uncertainty and these mixed messages about is it safe? Is it not safe? Some, you know, our government is saying it is, but then we have health officials saying that it isn't. But then we might have other health health officials supporting the government and saying it is, and it it's, creates a lot of stress for parents and teachers. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a real nuanced conversation around the the safeness of schools. Um, you know, both the CDC and the WHO have published, you know, research, peer reviewed research that indicates that. If there's community spread going on, that there is, that schools are likely not just spreaders, but typically super spreaders. Um, having said that, you know I, I listened to the the briefings well whenever they happened for uh, back home in Newfoundland, you know, with uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, and you know her line has always been we don't you know because teachers are fairly low in tier two on the vaccination list in Newfoundland. And her logic is that if there isn't community spread going on, so if we have safe communities, then we all have safe schools, um, you know, which has largely worked in Newfoundland. And, and the one time that it did get into a couple of schools in the Mount Pearl area, Newfoundland shut down for four weeks. And, 
um, you know, we've been good ever since. So uh, it, it is really a fine line and also a nuanced understanding of the role that I think schools can play in this. Um, just saying one or the other really doesn't help a lot, but unfortunately politicians so often talk in black and white. Yeah, well, it's interesting though, Bonnie Henry, the public health officer in BC, uh, was based on March data, but she had data that indicated that students were safer in schools than they were in the community, that there was a higher risk of community spread because students were not in a structured controlled environment, that in the school, they were structured and controlled and there were less spread. Now that was before the variants, which are have a higher spreading capability. So it's it's really, it's like everything that you can find some information that supports some ideas and you kind of have to trust, but the track record for politicians making decisions is difficulty and where medical health professionals uh, and epidemiologists, you know, we can just look to South to see Fauci and, and the issues that, that went on in the US. Um, but I'm interested as well, Michael, because you now are you, being in the US probably know a little bit more what's going on because of the vaccines spread in the number of people. Is there any change that's happening uh, in schools? Are there, what's, what's the forecast now that's happening around schools as they open up or more available and accessible? And what are some of the risks down the road? Well, I think that here in the US, what we're seeing is, is um, obviously the previous administration had a very clear goal of keeping schools open regardless and many of the individual states that um, came from the same political stripe um, have done that. You know, so if you look at a jurisdiction like Texas, uh, as a good example, um, the, the governor there has, you know, signed a number of executive orders that actually prevent schools from going into a hybrid model or going into an online model in much the same way they've prevented counties from implementing mask mandates uh, there. Uh, whereas here in um, California, we've sort of gone the, the, the exact opposite track where the, the governor has mandated uh, many of these things. Schools were largely closed um, or in hybrid fashions. You've seen some local movements trying to get them to open up, but from the state level, it's largely been closed. Uh, but moving forward, I mean, we do have the advantage down here of a, a fair amount of capacity to produce vaccines and, and unfortunately vaccine nationalism um, has continued into the current administration as it was with the former administration essentially that if it's produced here we're going to use it here until we're okay but right now we've got about 30 percent of the population that's uh, been vaccinated um, here in california we've been quite well we actually have about 35 that's received both doses another 25 that's received a single dose. But even with that, you're starting to see interesting things happening. Like yesterday, California State University system, as well as the University of California system, announced that they're requiring all students, staff, and faculty to have the vaccine in order to return to campus in the fall. Um, so if you don't get vaccinated, they don't want you there. Uh, you can learn online from them, but they don't want you physically there. Uh, we haven't seen any K-12 districts move in that direction yet. And I'm not sure if we will only because, you know, public education is a public right, but um, it, we're starting to see then the UC system and CSU system are the largest to do that in the US thus far, but not the only ones. I have some reflections on what I'm noticing about inequities in teaching and access. You want me to comment on that, Joelle? Absolutely, yes. The red yeah, it's just it's just come to light in Alberta as we have more and more teachers and students going out, uh, self isolating and not able to teach. That the subs who are being brought in, there's two messages I've heard in the last couple of weeks. One is that if the subs are brought in in a face-to-face -face environment, and some of those students are remotely piping in with unparalleled communication into that face-to-face -face environment, those subs are being told they do not need to deliver to the students who are online. First thing. And the second thing is that 
in some areas, the licensing that has been secured by the board through G Suite has two levels of licensing. So for the full-time contracted teacher, and then another level of licensing for the sub. And that sub teacher does not have the full suite of tools, including muting, creating breakouts, removing a student. And so uh, right there and then we've created this inequity of teachers but it also begs the question for me here in Alberta, we, uh, our teachers have a set of competencies under the teacher quality standard. And all of a sudden for me, it's, it's saying, we are, we are telling our teachers they cannot assert that competency because our licensing is like sending somebody into a brick and mortar school and saying, you're a sub, you don't get a blackboard today, or we're gonna lock all the windows, you can't get fresh air or whatever. But it, 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 it's sort of an, a layer that to, to me, and I, um, I've been advocating that we, we need to be looking at teaching practice, not who's doing it. And that this whole concept, right from the get-go, um, I, I explain to folks the research around unparalleled communication. So this idea that kids remotely typing into a face-to-face -face room all of a sudden become an audience in their own classroom and a guest. And it became very clear when our superintendent and our board had a student um, you know, focus group with 46 students. And with the exception of three that came from our school as full-time onlineers like Brad's school, the 43 of those students told the superintendent they hated online learning because of that unparalleled communication. And then the three full-timers were a totally different story. We're engaged with our teachers, blah, 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 all the good pedagogy and so on. And that came out. And so it was only as a result of the student feedback that that uh, practice is going to change, but it changed to, okay, subs don't have to deliver online. And so it's really, it's really forcing some real clear and deep thinking about teaching practice too, isn't it? The difference between the remote emergency teaching and the truly online committed because you want to be there. Exactly. And that was my, my stepson's experience. So he's in high school. And so that those times where he's online, he's, he's just viewing his class. He's viewing the teacher teach his, his peers. And there's very little to sometimes no interaction that way. And so he, he just, and he, you know, he, he's invested in school. He likes school, but he's like, there's no engagement. I wish that they would like engage us. And I, and there were some teachers that tried to do some breakout rooms and such um, for those students that were online. But, but what we were seeing here in Windsor is that because all of the technology was being um, farmed out to students who were remote, there's no technology in the classes, in the classrooms. So, cause I was thinking, well, how could you be in a breakout room then with your peers who are actually in the face-to-face -face space so that you can kind of be together and they can't because there are no laptops, there are no iPads. And so that also creates this odd kind of conundrum when you know we're so heavily wanting to focus on digital literacies and digital pedagogies. But like for my husband who teaches grade seven and eight, he can't do any technology in the classroom. He has no option to. And so now that we're back in lockdown and online, he's able to kind of do stuff that he right. wanted to do. Right. Um, but again, like my, my son, he was just very disengaged because, and they would even sometimes like, they would watch a film or something, but it wasn't up on the screen for him. It was actually him watching a screen in the classroom. And so, you know, it's fuzzy, it lags, it's, yeah. One of the strategies that we I've used in the past is I have trained moderators in my face to face environment, those students, and then I've layered on another credit course. So I've actually done the e learning course with those moderators in the face to face room. And then 
translated or cross-trained those students who were online piping in so that they developed an awareness, a metacognitive awareness of what was happening. And then uh, again, layered on a bundled credit. So there was some motivation for them to be doing this and learning. Uh, and, and then as I cross-trained in that face-to-face -face room, they took turns to ensure that the online community was engaged with the face-to-face -face community. Um, and that is possible if you can overcome that unparalleled communication, but yeah, you've got to have a skilled facilitator teacher. Exactly. And so that leads to, um, you know, teachers, they need to be having professional development and professional learning so that they, they can develop those skills. Um, we can't just, you know, put a camera in the classroom and say, okay, now we can split the cohort up because look at now they can view your lesson when they don't have any access to, to any kind of real pedagogy that's going on. Yeah. Well, in addition to the teacher training, a lot of it is just how we equip the classrooms. I mean, you think about where this is typically happening. You know, you've got a teacher with a single desktop computer, or maybe a, if they're lucky, a laptop computer um, that has to be used both to connect to whatever display they've got for the in-room students, but also used as a Zoom device. Nine times out of 10, the camera that they're using is either mounted to the top of the monitor of the desktop or is built into the laptop itself, right? So it forces the teacher to be always in front of the device. And it also means that the students can't see their fellow students. Uh, I was working with a, a district in the fall talking about you know how we how you could do this in an effective way. And, and I said, well, the first thing you need to do is you need to equip every single classroom with you know a, a swivel type device or you know essentially a, a classroom or a camera that roamed so that the teacher could wear a tracker and walk around the room and you've got a camera in the back that essentially is tracking them wherever they go. In addition to the teacher's computer, which just should be used for what is happening in the room, you should have a second computer that they've got hooked up to Zoom with both of them logged into Zoom. So you've got one that just have the Zoom screen up with the gallery on it and a second one that's used for the actual room. In addition to that, you want two big monitors about halfway down the classroom on either side that stick out so that when I'm looking out at the students in the room, I can just glance to the side and I see the students that are in the Zoom in the same way as if they were sitting in the room with me. I want two monitors up front, one that actually is displaying what the, you know, what I'm teaching, one that's displaying the students in the room so all the students in the room can see everyone in there. So if you're counting it up here now, I'm looking at, you know, four computers, or sorry, two computers, four monitors, a camera in the back of the room following me, a camera up in the corner that's faced out at the students, all of which is going at the same time. Now multiply that by the number of rooms you have in your building, you know, can you do that? And, and then the, if the question is no, which very few can, obviously, can you equip it in some of the rooms? And then, and this is the other issue that we also have. So often we make teachers do everything. So you've got one teacher that's responsible for both their online teaching and their face-to-face -face teaching. Why don't we just take a couple of folks that we know are a little bit more tech savvy than others and make them 100% responsible for the online students and make another group 100% responsible for the face-to-face -face groups? You know, it makes it a lot easier because you've got fewer people to train to do something new. And obviously, in many cases, they're folks that have volunteered to do so, oftentimes because either they're interested in it or some cases because, you know, maybe they fall into one of those at risk groups. And this is a way to, you know, remove them from the classroom and some of the risks that come with being in a, you know, face to face setting with students that are going back home to their parents who are out in the communities and, you know, you start multiplying out, you know, the number of contacts you have there. Um, you know, so there's other ways in which you can set that up if you can't manage the physical setup. So I, I'm going to do something that you do to me, Mr. Barber, and I'm going to take exception and argue against you as what you described as a scenario of multiple of teaching both students in school and classrooms and on monitors is a, an instructional practice and a pedagogy that is, is not appropriate or next to impossible as you've indicated, but still that presumes a lecture and a delivery model where it's more of a facilitated engagement model. 
And as Tony said this morning, the affordances of asynchronous are far more rich and robust and much more learner and individual centric that are important. Yet there are times, there are times when you want to do that sort of a, a you know, a, a delivery, but you're better to record it because then you have the opportunity for students to see it at different times. So I think that, and, and I know that teaching kids in a classroom and online simultaneously did occur. Oh my God. Does anyone have an experience that they want to share about doing that or being told to do that or trying to do that? No one got to do it, right? Well, I think it's the difference between doing it and doing it in a room that was specifically designed for it as well. Well, yeah, the video conferencing technology was that kind of a room before where you come there to use that to engage in broadcast. So that principle is still certainly remains. And it, it is possible, and but yet I know also when I teach human with adults online and teachers, um, I I've changed my practices and from being synchronous delivery, and you know to being asynchronous record what I want to say and then have this have a chat checkerboard Brady bunch and that's all I do live only do it a couple of times in my course. Um. So for us here, we do for um in Ontario there are boards like our board here in Windsor, where we have specific teachers now um, that are, are teaching only online. And I just, knowing, knowing about, you know, digital pedagogies and how, as you mentioned, like there's, there's two different things that have to go on, but what we're seeing and what I can see for my son's experience, who's in grade four, the, there's that tendency to, to want to mimic the school day, but just be online. And, and we're doing kind of the same things and, and engaging or not really engaging in how can we kind of transform this space and interact in different ways. And so I'm concerned, one of my concerns is that, so our government in Ontario has kind of proposed through that out there for everybody to debate about keeping the option to be remote um, permanent. So any, um, parent that wants to just keep their their student online um, come September and it'll be a permanent option. Um, so my my concern is that then, but are is there going to be teacher learning, professional learning and development that goes along with that so that we can make sure that that experience for them is transformative, but at the same time, there's also no money for this. And so if boards you know, are being forced to do that, then all their technology and all that still, all this inequity and all this kind of, you know, stuff that we're kind of coming up against is going to be permanent. And <laughs> like, cause I don't know where else the money would come from other than you have to then take from all these other places in order to allocate it there. But it just kind of creates some, um, a very <laughs> unpleasant kind of imagining. Exactly. It's much more deliberate. And I know in Ontario, the consortiums have evolved with the model, which has the asynchronous and all of the other pieces, as well as the skill building. And the DELCs and TELCs also in Ontario boards uh, are there to be helpful. So it's, it's, it's a question of, of a different model that's being implied right now. Uh, and the grassroots building up model is the one where this is what we argued before when they first announced four mandatory e-learning courses is how do you scale that? Unless you're just gonna do a standard deliver and a content, you know, didactic kind of a pedagogy, then that's where it is. Folks, I have to say, we have to cut this off because I have to go and launch the next session. If you want to, it's Lisa Gadax and she's done um, a study as well on Gulf Islands uh, and some of the principles that she came up with in her own study mimic what Tony had and I invited, I saw her present at Royal Roads and I invited her to come. So if you want to have more of this type of conversation, go to uh, Lisa's piece otherwise. Um, Brad. Yeah, um, I just wanted to uh, definitely thank Joel, uh, Michael and Randy and uh, everyone else who contributed in this session. It's been a lot of uh, great information and uh, sharing. So thank you very much. Uh, My and pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, it's been been wonderful to hear all it and uh, just have that good rich discussion we had about teaching practice and everything. So thank you so much. Awesome. Stay Bye. tuned for more, we hope. <laughs> yes. Joelle, it's been great to work with you as well.
Thank you so much, Randy. Yes, it's been my pleasure. I've learned a lot. It's